Question from the audience. I'd like to ask the For the Motion group to comment on the, some of the uh, scary statistics around the flight of professional and middle class and what do you see as the facts and the reality today of where the country stands and then how does that evolve or correct itself going forward as the country builds? Now that's a question. <laughs> <laughs> Jack Keane. Uh, actually, I'm going to start Fred's off. Fred's going to start oh, Fred Kagan, his forward. partner, will go first. Um, I, it's interesting. I just had the, this uh, similar conversation with uh, a senior Iraqi uh, military leader uh, last night, in fact. And um, he made a point that the flight of the, uh, of the middle class in Iraq and the technocratic class um, began, in fact, with the rise of Saddam, um, when you had a tremendous number of highly educated people flee the country. It certainly was exacerbated as the Baathist elements um, and the Sunni, uh, you know, community, elements of the Sunni community, and also Shi'i community, there are Shi'i Baathists, we tend to forget that, um, fled. Are those people coming back? On the whole, no, they're not coming back. Will they? It remains to be seen. Um, what's going on is the formation of a new uh, government in Iraq. It certainly was set back by mistakes that we made uh, early on, the excessively harsh debothification policy. On the other hand, there is an analogy to the denazification uh, strategy after World War II, and there was a lot of controversy about that. If you want the people who will administer the country efficiently, then going back to some of the people who were involved in the previous dictatorship might make sense. Although, I would point out that that was one of the most corrupt and inefficient and ineffective dictatorships that there's ever been at everything except keeping itself in power and threatening its neighbors. And so it's not as though there was exactly good governance in Iraq before 2003, and it's not as though there was a large cadre of government officials in Iraq before 2003 whom you would have wanted to see in senior positions now. Nevertheless, excessive debothification set the process back. What we are seeing now is the construction of a new Iraqi society. This will take a long time. And I think part of the problem that we have in this discussion is that we tend to conflate the question with um, are we winning with the question have we won? The truth of the matter is we are winning in the sense that with respects from Malcolm, not just in the matter of military uh, arena, but in, the, in uh, respect to politics and also now finally economic development, we are moving in the right direction. We do see the formation of uh, Iraqi bureaucratic class. We do see uh, the development of Iraqi technocrats, small in number, um, ineffective in some respects, still learning the ropes as they develop a new system, but we are making progress. We will have achieved, when we have achieved the aim of having this all worked out, we won't be winning, we will have won. Let, let me add to that. Uh, Jack Because Keen. some of you may be, uh, may be thinking about that. When we talk about a long struggle in Iraq, we do not mean a long troop presence in Iraq. All of us believe strongly that we will t reduce our forces in 2009, we will even more dramatically reduce them in 2010. And I have held the view if you put Maliki's number on the table, number and date on the table, with Obama's, McCain's, and Petraeus's, they wouldn't be that far apart. And I think that's where we are, to be quite frank about it, in terms of our combat forces coming out, because the, their presence is needed right now to see through the political process to make certain that these provincial elections uh, are not maligned and to make certain that the national election is not maligned. We don't have those large forces there because of the insurgency or because of the Al-Qaeda. We want to make certain that the political process is moving forward. And the, the U.S. and coalition presence in Iraq has been the glue that has been holding things together. It is a myth that has been perpetuated. And people who perpetuate it don't know the Iraqis when they say by pulling our forces away, Somehow that would be a catalyst to f and a call to action for the Iraqis to do something that they're not capable of doing while we're there. We have been the catalyst and the glue that have helped them, and our presence has been very important. And that presence is going to dramatically change in terms, it already has in terms of casualties, that'll continue to go down to almost nothing. And also the numbers of our troops will dramatically go down over time as well. And I just want to clear that up 
while you have long-term political objectives in Iraq, that does not mean that we're going to have combat troops in Iraq fighting in Iraq for years to come. Sir Malcolm, I see you taking notes on that. Do you want to respond? Well, I, I think that there are always going to be good consequences of bad wars, just as there are sometimes bad consequences of good wars. What you've got to do is come to an honest judgment as to where the balance lies. Have the sacrifices been worthwhile of the Iraqi people, of the American people, of the coalition forces, but particularly of the Iraqis? Uh, is the net effect of this terrible five years something that was worth doing in the first place? If the answer is no, it wasn't, then the fact that there have been some benefits Sure, that always happens even in the worst wars for the worst reasons. Your, your, your comment on sacrifices raises for me the question of the, of, the, of the price that has been paid in blood. And I want to ask, with as much sensitivity as possible and as much honor for the families of those who have lost soldiers, Charles Ferguson, did those men die for nothing? Uh, I think it's worse than that. I think it's much worse than that. I, I, I think that history is going to record George Bush as one of the most um, horrifically arrogant, rigid, stupid, inhumane morons we have ever. Uh, it, look, in, in, my, in my film, six minutes into my film, there is a clip of uh, a very intelligent, honest, accomplished man who was the chairman of the National Intelligence Council from 2003 to 2005. And the first thing that he says is that what he found the most revealing, he, he began on his own initiative, not asked by the administration, not asked by the president, he began uh, performing intelligence estimates of the insurgency. And he gave them to the highest level of the administration. And he said that what he found most revealing was that President Bush not only had not read the estimate, but had not even read the one-page executive summary. Would victory vindicate those deaths? Victory would. Uh, in 1972, when he was first visiting China, uh, Henry Kissinger asked Zhou Enlai uh, whether, in Zhou Enlai's view, the French Revolution had been a success. And Zhou Enlai's response was, it's too early to tell. Now, by that standard, maybe we're winning. Fred Kagan, can, can you take on the question of the sacrifice? I'd actually like to surprise the audience by agreeing with the last remark that uh, Mr. Ferguson made. It is too soon to tell. Um, if we win the war, then the sacrifice will not have been in vain. Um, I think it's fair to say that no soldier who sacrifices his life or her life for their country makes a vain sacrifice. Um, but, and I, and I dislike that, I don't think that that's really the issue because I don't think that the, 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 the nature of the sacrifice should be bound up with our judgments about whether the war is successful or not. Um, it is too soon to tell. The funny thing about a war is that it's not over until it's over. And what seems like a good idea in year one can seem like a very bad idea in year three, can seem like a very good idea in year 10, can seem like a very bad idea in year 50. Um, and that's why you can't make a permanent decision and stamp it in stone as the, those speaking against the motion would basically like to do. They'd like to say this, the, the sunk cost in this war is so high that nothing that could conceivably happen would be worth it. Therefore, the war was a failure and a loss. Um, and Bush is a word that I can't use on the air. Um, and the problem is, that's, the story doesn't end there. The question is, what will happen in the years to come? And we don't know. Right now, it appears to me that the trends are positive to have quite a profound impact on the Middle East. And what impresses me is that it is Iraqis who are engaged in this process actively who are saying so. And this isn't, I'm not talking about Ahmad Chalabi and other um, folks like that who've been discredited. I'm talking about people who are actually engaged day to day in running their country. This is what they're saying. If that is in fact the case, and I think that it is, then not only will those deaths not have been in vain, as, as no military deaths are, but they will have served a tremendous uh, interest of the United States of America and the world.